All right, today we're going to begin with a little review of the early Genesis narrative. Uh, I'm going to take us through uh, the first 11 chapters just to give you a quick uh, review as the scripture gets us started. Of course, uh, we begin with the creation narrative and how God uh, made everything. Uh, <clears throat> from there, uh, it moves on into the story of Adam and Eve and uh, the Garden of Eden and the exit from the Garden of Eden, uh, what is often referred to as the fall of man, uh, where they, uh, they sin. Uh, and then uh, we start getting to the next generation. Adam and Eve had sons, uh, Adam or Cain and Abel. And that story, of course, includes uh, the first murder. Uh, that kind of uh, explosive sin began early. Once, it, once sin was unleashed in the world, it, it took off at a, at a good pace. Uh, and, of course, they had other sons and daughters, uh, including one named Seth, uh, from whom uh, the next parts of our story uh, follow his descendants. Uh, and so then the scripture goes into this stories of how the population expanded and, and grew, and these sons had these sons and daughters, and so on and so forth, uh, until we come to the story of Noah and the flood, uh, including his son, Shem. Uh, and the story of how they got on the ark and, and uh, kind of started civilization over again. The next couple chapters move into ideas about uh, the, the population explosion that took place and how it grew uh, even more. Uh, <clears throat> and then it kind of narrows in on Shem and his descendants until it gets to the point where it talks about one of his descendants being named Terah. And, uh, and then it kind of narrows in on Terra for a paragraph uh, as the story gets uh, closer and closer to the, what it's most interested in. And it mentions that Terra had three sons, uh, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, that's basically in a nutshell Genesis 1 to 11. Um, but then right at the end of 11, we're told that uh, Terra. Uh, along with his son Abraham, moved from Ur to Haran. Uh, and so, you know, you can see down here is uh, Ur of the Chaldeans. And, you know, those of you who are familiar with uh, the Middle East, there, there's the Persian Gulf. Uh, this is, you know, like the Iraq and Iran area and all of that. Uh, and so, uh, Terah and Abraham took this journey up to Haran. Now we're told at some point that they were actually intending to go to the Canaan land, but that they stopped there and hung out. And so that is uh, what is going on when the story I want to look at today picks up. So today we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12, beginning with the very first verse. I'm going to read just the first three and a half verses. If you need help finding it, page 9 in our worship Bible. Uh, in your Bible, it might be 7 or 8 or 10, but it's going to be right close to the beginning. Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. I'm going to stop reading right there. Uh, <clears throat> so we have here uh, what is often referred to as the, the call of Abraham. In fact, the, uh, the NIV uses that subtitle for this section. The call of Abraham, or the call of Abram. Uh, and by the way, uh, most of you know that uh, a little later in life, uh, Abram had his name changed to Abraham. And we talk about him as Abraham more than we talk about him as Abram. And uh, I just confess, I am very prone to, uh, to slip up here. So the Bible story is talking about Abram. Uh, I am liable to just refer to him as Abraham about half the time this morning. Uh, if I do, uh, excuse me and realize that I'm talking about Abram at this point. 
So I want to look at, uh, at some details surrounding this call because I think that it parallels uh, our, our modern life. I think that God calls us uh, sometimes. He just calls us into a relationship with Him. That comes pretty early, that, that call to salvation. Uh, but later in life, He might call us to, to certain tasks, to bigger tasks. Uh, it might be that He calls you to an entire vocation or career. It might be that He calls you to take on a, a, a small ministry of church. Uh, who knows? But uh, I think that there are some parallels as to how these calls work and some characteristics that, that overlap and the, the things that Abraham went through, we might go through the same thing. And so it's good for us to just kind of recognize them and be aware. Uh, and part of it is just to kind of demonstrate God's love and the way he works. So the first thing I want you to notice is that God was the initiator. There's nothing in the story about how Abraham was, uh, was seeking God. There's nothing about the story about how Abraham was saying, you know, I need more in my life. I need to find this true God and worship him. And, and you know, I need to put myself in, you know, I, I'm going to go out and fast for, uh, for 40 days and, and try to find myself in God. And there was nothing like that going on that we are aware of. Uh, apparently, uh, Abraham was living his life. Uh, and by the way, uh, his lifestyle would be pretty primitive for us, but for his time in the world, uh, he was probably one of the well-off ones. He probably had things pretty good uh, and was quite wealthy. In fact, his, the city he came from was known to be a, a wealthy city with wealthy people. And so, uh, so he's probably enjoying life and uh, things are going smooth. Uh, he's not actively seeking God, probably. And suddenly, God says, it's time for me to work with Abraham. Uh, and he comes to Abraham and speaks to Abraham and gives him this particular call. Um, in more modern days, uh, the, the theologists, the teachers, uh, have given, used the term prevenient grace. Uh, and that term means the grace that comes before. And so we often talk about we are saved by grace and that God, uh, you know, gives us eternal life through grace. Um, but prevenient grace is what the, the theologians and the Bible scholars term they use to describe the grace of God working in our lives even before that. Before we come to Christ, uh, God is speaking to you. We, we believe, for example, that the conscience is a strong part of that. Um, when, when you do something and you feel like that was wrong, I shouldn't have done that, uh, that's partly God speaking to your heart and mind. And if you do have that longing for something more, if you do have that desire to find God, that's God calling you to Him. That is uh, prevenient grace. And uh, we are thankful uh, for the prevenient grace that we have. In fact, um, people talk about how well, so-and-so is not a Christian, but he seems to have an awfully good heart and does good works. Uh, we believe that's prevenient grace working in their lives. Uh, that, that even people who haven't come to Christ, God can uh, speak to their hearts and minds and put desires and burdens in their hearts and minds and, and uh, do those things. So there can be quote-unquote good people out there uh, who don't know Christ. Uh, but Christ still gets the credit because it's prevenient grace. <clears throat> Next thing I want you to notice is that the call came in an unlikely place. Uh, the land of Ur, and then up to Haran. Um, it doesn't say that, uh, like Moses, you know, that, that Abraham went out into the desert to find God, and God met him in the desert. Uh, it doesn't say that he was at the Jordan River being baptized when God spoke to, uh, about Jesus there at his baptism. Uh, it wasn't those kinds of circumstances. They were, in fact, in a city, both Ur and Haran, uh, that were known to, uh, to worship multiple gods. They were very polytheistic, many, many gods. Um, they had their own uh, city gods. Uh, besides that, uh, that particular area was known to be moon worshipers. Uh, and, and they didn't have any qualms with having more than one. Um, they believed gods did different things, and 
uh, if you wanted uh, help with your, uh, with your crops, you might need to worship one god. If you need help against your enemies, you might need to worship a different god. Because they all had their strengths and weaknesses, and you had to, to pick and choose which gods you were going to worship. Um, <clears throat> and so they were in that kind of an area uh, where there's all these uh, pagan worship. And Abraham would have grown up in that. That would be what he had been taught from birth. And by now, he's 75 years old, and, uh, and he's just living in this place where the city is, uh, has all these false gods, including idols, by the way. Uh, they would make statues out of wood and stone, and, and, and then they would have a ceremony uh, in which they would uh, give life to those statues, and then they would worship those statues. Uh, so, you know, think about that. I'm going to do a carving, maybe a little ceremony to make the carving of God, and then I'm going to worship that God. Um, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. But it was in that place, when Abraham living in that culture, when suddenly the real God shows up and says, Abraham, uh, go from your country, your people, your family, you know, and gives him the call to respond. Um, so there were, of course, the city gods, the moon, other gods, and the idols. Uh, and the call came to an unlikely person. Who in the world is Abraham? Until the end of the 11th chapter, never heard of him. He just shows up in this long line of descendants. Uh, he's one amongst many. Uh, and suddenly we're going to focus on him. Uh, now, Abraham runs into a guy named Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, uh, later on in life. And uh, <clears throat> this Melchizedek was known to be a priest of the Most High God. And Abraham uh, even uh, gives him uh, an offering and, and you know, kind of bows to him and shows respect to him. And so Melchizedek was the kind of guy <laughs> that you'd think maybe God would have used him. He seemed to be a, a, a priest uh, before the official priesthood was even established. And, uh, and God worked with him. Uh, most of you are familiar with the story of Joel. It shows up in about the middle of the Bible. Um, even though it shows up in the middle of the Bible, it's put there because of the kind of literature that it is. It's considered the, the poetry and wisdom literature instead of just historical narrative literature. Uh, but the scholars believe that it actually took place, the setting of the book of Job was in Abraham's time. Uh, that's when Job would have been happening. And Job was told, we're told, you know, was such a righteous guy that God kind of brags about him. Uh, one would think that maybe Job would have been the kind of guy that God would have called instead of Abraham. Uh, and so uh, we have that kind of a, an unlikely person. Uh, sometimes we might feel uh, unlikely. Uh, also, the call came, uh, oh, I also wanted to mention that Abraham had known flaws. Uh, we know that as we follow him, he didn't always do everything on the up and up. There are a couple times when he's caught in a lie and in some deceit and trickery. Uh, and where he's not trusting God, and other times he is. Um, so he uses some misjudgments. So you think, you know, he's really not the person to think God would call for the task God is calling him to. So unlikely person, sometimes, you know, we feel unlikely. The call came with blessings. Uh, God wasn't just uh, giving him a job. Uh, he was going to bless him. And those blessings take several forms. Uh, he's going to make him into a great nation. At one point it literally just says, I will bless you. It doesn't define what those blessings are. It says he's going to make his name great. Uh, and then he says he's going to be on your side. Uh, think about that. You know, you, 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 whose side are you on? And God says, oh, I'm on his side. Uh, if people will bless him, if people are on his side, then I'm on their side. People who are against him, if people curse him, I'm going to curse them. Uh, so you know, you've got God in your corner, uh, as Abraham did. Um, and so uh, that was one of those great blessings. Uh, and then there was a particular blessing that was a little on the, uh, the different category side. And that is that the call was a call to be a blessing. And if you've ever been a blessing to someone, uh, you know that that's a blessing in itself. Uh, when you've done something for someone, you find out that it really made a difference in their lives and really helped them, and they appreciate it. 
Um, that feels good in and of itself. And so that's one of those special blessings. The call uh, that included blessings was also a call to be a blessing. And again, that took a couple of forms. Uh, he told him that you'll be a blessing. And that eventually, he said, all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And uh, looking back, we've discovered that that happened in the person of Jesus Christ, who as we follow Abraham's descendants, eventually Jesus was one of them. Uh, and so uh, through Abraham, uh, the whole world was going to be blessed. Uh, and that was part of the call. When God calls us, um, there's got to be blessings in our life, and we're going to be able to bless people if we follow him, because that's what he's calling us to do. I want to point out that the call wasn't easy. Uh, Abraham was told to leave your country, your people, your family. Um, that's not always an easy thing to do. I have a nephew, uh, my oldest nephew, ring bearer in my wedding, uh, who is now in Mexico. Uh, because his company, about a year ago, came and said, we want you to pack up and move to Mexico and work there for a year or two. Uh, and so he did, and so he's now in a foreign country, his family's all back here. And he talked about, you know, that, that was going to be hard to do. Uh, it was a tough decision to make. Uh, and even in his case, well, you can fly home every few months, you know, and you can visit and uh, those kinds of things. Your wife can come with you and you don't have to leave her behind and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but that's not easy to do. You know, if you, if you got uh, a call later this week, said, uh, we want you to move uh, to Africa, take on a position there. Um, you, think, you know, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Um, Robert and I, uh, a few years ago, began discussions about what we want to do when we retire. We began thinking about places in the country we could move to. And then after giving us some thought and doing some research and all of that, we said, well, you know, uh, it kind of depends on where Chelsea and Landon are. Because, you know, we don't want to leave them behind. We want to be by them. Uh, and so we might as well forget about this. And when we get time to actually retire, we'll see where they are. Uh, they happen to be here. Uh, so we might just stay here. Um, so, uh, that... Uh, uh, leaving your country, your people, your family, uh, not necessarily an easy thing to do. And of course, if God calls you to do something, it might not be easy. Uh, it might be a hard thing to do. In fact, one of the hardest things, like enough for me to give it a special category, uh, is the call included unknowns. Uh, God didn't say, I want you to go to Africa. God said, Go to the land I will show you. I've tried that one on. God says, I want you to pack up and go. Where do you want me to go, Lord? I'll show you down the road. I'll let you know when you get there. I'll tell you which way to turn. Um, that's hard. Not even knowing where he wants you to go. Not even knowing what he has in store for you. Um, very difficult. Um, what am I... Uh, the Church of Nazarene used to publish what we called missionary books. There would be about half a dozen a year that our missionaries would write, kind of uh, short books, kind of giving a story of what's going on, where they are, and what they're doing. Well, in one of those missionary books, uh, the title was That Big Blue Mountain. Um, this, uh, this guy says that he's, he's applied to be a missionary, and in the Church of the Nazarene, most of the time, uh, you don't get to choose where you're going. Um, God works through the church and through you and every now and then there's, a, there's something special made that God is really specific and detailed um, but you, you meet up with the general board of the Church of the Nazarene and they interview you and you go through the process of getting trained and then the board says to you this is where we want you to go and you say well, okay I'll do that and uh, so one of the stories is uh, this guy's been preparing for missions. Uh, he spoke Spanish, so he thought, I'm going to South America, I'm going to Central America, uh, that's what's going to happen to me. And, uh, and he met with the general board, 
And they interviewed him, final interview, you know, you're, you're accepted as a missionary, uh, time for the placement meeting. They said, will you go to Indonesia? And he said, I literally said, sure, where is it? <laughs> uh, and then the reason it was called that Big Blue Mountain is at a garage sale a year or two earlier, they had bought a picture that they just thought was beautiful and hung it in their living room over their couch. And it turned out this picture was a picture of a mountain in Indonesia. And that had been hanging over their couch for a couple of years. They didn't even know it. Um, but, but I love that. Sure, where is it? But, you know, that is, is being obedient. That is following what God has to say. So uh, Abraham, go to the land I will show you. And Abraham said that he would. And then the last detail I want to mention is that the call required obedience. Uh, this was not simply a case of God saying, this is what's going to happen, sit tight. God, God had something that he wanted Abraham to do. I want you to get up and go and take what we're going to show you. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, Abraham, I'm going to cause this to happen. I'm going to bring war down and these guys are going to be defeated. Just sit still and watch. Abraham's, okay, Lord, I'll sit still and watch. Uh, he, he was giving Abraham a choice. Abraham could have said, I'm not going. Uh, you know, we believe that God gives us free will. Uh, and so uh, there was this decision to be made. Is he going to be obedient or is he not? Uh, my dad uh, was called to be a minister. Uh, later in life that a lot of ministers are called. He was in his early 30s uh, and was uh, had, had told God that he would be a minister if that's what he really wanted and you know I'll, I'll go to school and get trained and whatever. Uh, but he continued to keep his job and uh, he was kind of doing a little house remodel. He was painting one of the hallways and while painting the hallway he said God's voice spoke to me and said are you going to be obedient? Or not? Sure, Lord, I'll be obedient. Then put your house up for sale. Okay, I will. I mean, now. He was kind of dumbfounded. So, so he drove, uh, kind of put away the paint, drove down to the gas uh, uh, hardware store, uh, bought a for sale by owner sign, brought it back, put it in our front window got dressed and went to work. Uh, he worked until about 11 o'clock that night, got home by 11.30. There was a note on the, on the table that my mom had written. Call Ken Yachlin. He said no matter what time you get home. So my dad, 11.30 at night, called Ken Yachlin. Ken said, uh, what do you want for your house? I want this much. I'll take it. So God told him to sell the house about noon. By, 11, by midnight, it was sold uh, because he was obedient to God. And uh, a few months later, uh, he accepted a, a pastor position uh, that needed a pastor that could keep the job besides because the church couldn't afford to pay him enough. And uh, the, the church that he took was halfway between where we were living and where he worked. So we moved closer to work. Uh, he kept his job and began pastoring that little church. Um, but, you know, he had to do something. Uh, you know, he, he had to take action. I think when God calls us, uh, it's a call to action. And, and we have a choice. Are we going to be obedient or not? Uh, and we really need to choose yes. Uh, it might be hard. There will be blessings. You get to be a blessing. Uh, you might have to face some unknowns and trust God and believe in Him. Um, but, but the blessings are worth it, uh, is the net result. And those blessings include, as we talked about, uh, eternal life with God. And you might get the call in an unlikely place. Uh, my dad painting the hallway in our house. Uh, Abraham living in a pagan city where everyone's worshiping other gods. Um, <clears throat> you might not feel like you're the right person. Lord, what about Melchizedek over here? Uh, wouldn't he be better at it? Wouldn't, you know? uh, 
you know, if God calls you, you have to uh, accept that. God, God knows all things, of course, loves you. So if he's calling you, uh, you can trust him. Let's pray.